SJC 13271, Commonwealth v. Miguel Jones. Okay, uh, Attorney Payne, whenever you're ready. Please court, Assistant District Attorney Cynthia Payne on behalf of the Commonwealth. I'd like to begin by providing a very brief overview of Chapter 279, Section 2 in the 1996 legislation that created the youthful offender. Now, in 1913, the legislature enacted an act relative to police, district, municipal courts in their officials and practice. That's a precursor to today's 279-2. Now the language of present day 279.2 is the same as the 1913 version with the exception of the reformatory names. The relevant language, in all cases, the execution of sentences to, insert reformatory name, may be suspended and such suspension continued or revoked in the same manner and with the same effect as the execution of sentences in criminal cases. Now in 1996, the legislature enacted an act to provide for the prosecution of violent juvenile offenders. And this was in response to societal concerns about violent juvenile crimes, specifically with, with firearms committed by, by juveniles. Now, as this court has noted in, in many opinions, the act made comprehensive changes to the juvenile justice system and was intended to eliminate certain protections previously made available to all juveniles. Now the act defined youthful offender, and that's in chapter 119, 50, section 52. An individual age 14 through 18 who commits a felony and has either been previously committed to the Department of Youth Services, has committed an offense involving the threat or, or infliction of serious bodily harm, or as relevant here, has committed a violation of 269, 10A. Now the last portion of the youthful offender definition reads, provided that nothing in this clause shall allow for less than the imposition of the mandatory commitment periods provided for in Chapter 119, Section 58. Now, Chapter 119, 58, uh, among many things, sets forth the three dispositions a judge may impose when sentencing a youthful offender. That's any sentence provided for by law, a combination sentence, or as relevant here, a commitment to the Department of Youth Services until age 21. Now this court solicited amicus briefs on the very discreet issue of where a defendant has been adjudicated a youthful offender for violating Chapter 269, Section 10A, whether a judge imposing a sentence pursuant to Chapter 119.58C, whether that judge has the authority pursuant to 279 section two to commit the defendant to the Department of Youth Services and then suspend that commitment with probation? The answer is no. And that is based on the clear and unambiguous language contained in chapter 119 sections 52, 58, and chapter 279 section two. I would again direct the court to the last portion of the youthful offender Definition, nothing in this clause shall allow for less than the imposition of the mandatory commitment periods provided for in Chapter 119.58. And I would suggest to the court that where the purpose of the 1996 Act was to address violent crimes, specifically firearms committed by juveniles, where the legislature mandated a DYS commitment on delinquencies involving firearms, where 269.10a is the only criminal statute contained in the youthful offender definition, and where the legislature included in the youthful offender definition that phrase, nothing in this clause shall allow for less than the imposition of the mandatory commitment periods provided for in Chapter 119.58. Finally, where, where youthful offenders are have been, are considered more dangerous 
than delinquent ju juveniles, it defies common sense to read the availability of a suspended commitment on a youthful offender who has, uh, um, with respect to firearm offenses. C counsel, what, what do you make of your opposing counsel's d distinction between what's available if you're adjudicated as a youthful offender versus delinquency? I mean, I, I know you say it defies common sense, but there isn't the other statutory provision in conflict with that? Well, I, I think there's a way, to, by moving on to the language of 279 that there, there isn't a conflict. Um, so beyond the, la the clear language, what Commonwealth would suggest is the clear language is 119, 52, and 58. The language of 279-2, 2792 does not authorize a suspended commitment with charges uh, which preclude a suspended sentence like 269-10A. Uh, the relevant language of, to, did I answer your question? You you so if, if <laughs> I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying you've got to read this in harmony. The other one can't, the other statutory provision can infuse into it something that the judge would not be able to impose unless you look at the underlying charge. And that, if the 10A says you can't give a, a suspended sentence notwithstanding this discrepancy, or not discrepancy, but the delineation between delinquency and youthful offender, it's too bad. That's correct. I, I would say 279 gives the juvenile court judge the authority to suspend commitments to the Department of Youth Services to the same extent that adult sentences may be suspended. And I would direct the, poor, the court, this, this is not in my brief, to look at the 1913 Report of Committee on Legislation, page 46. By section two, the suspended sentence idea is extended to orders of commitment not amounting to sentences and therefore not within the suspended sentence law. But beyond, but even looking at the language of chapter 279-2, all is not superfluous. I would suggest the phrase in all cases means in all cases which allow for it. You, now, you, may, you may be right, but j just to indicate the implications of this. It has implications beyond mandatory minimum sentences. As, as we said in the last uh, case, you, you can't have a state prison sentence suspended. So there's gonna be a application beyond just um, mandatory minimums like you have with 10A. Possibly, I, I, I would suggest and um, I know my, my sister has, has indicated that this interpretation will, will absolutely decimate the juvenile justice system, but, but in, in the realm of criminal statutes, there are really only about 10 that overtly preclude a suspended sentence in the manner of 269-10A. No, but let, let, I just want to understand the implications of your argument. You very carefully went, w went through it, and I understand uh, your point, but if the sentences uh, can't be something not allowed in, in, in a criminal case. Um, and if in criminal cases, other than House of Correction sentences, there can never be a suspended sentence, then your argument has implications beyond mandatory minimum sentences. That, that may be true. Just trying to get the reach of the, of the decision if we agree with you. I, I would go back and I, and I would suggest I'm not sure if I said this. All is modified in this respect by in the same manner and with the same effect as the execution of sentences in criminal cases. Now, I, I would refer the court to the 1913 marginal notation, which summarized the statute. Uh, as you recall, the 1913 version, same verbiage with the exception of the reformatory names. That's Acts 1913, Chapter 471, Section 2, which reads, the execution of certain orders of commitment may be suspended. I would suggest to this court that the phrase certain orders is indicative of the legislative intent that all means all cases that, that allow for it. Now, ninth, chapter 119, section 53, mandates that sections 52 through 63 be construed liberally and as far as practicable. Counsel, can I ask you a more practical question? Um, this is done so often that it has been embedded 
in juvenile court forms, right? So I, I guess I'm wondering, do they just, have they just had this wrong all of this time in that, you know, the folks that do this every day, in, in, including the sign off of the chief of the department, did you just get this wrong? Well, well I, I did walk this back a little bit, because here I'm saying that it, it depends in part on the underlying statute, sure. but, but if, if we were to go down that route, uh, I mean, this isn't an issue that the court has analyzed, so just because it's on a pre-printed form, that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. I mean, the, there are model jury instructions that this court has determined were not quite correct. So I think especially here- And so given, given that, what does the rule of lenity tell us? Well I, well, I would suggest that the rule of lenity does not apply because the language of 119.52 and um, sections 58 and 279.2 are not ambiguous at all. Moreover, the- but, but, but in connection with your argument, you're pointing us to a report um, and, and, and notes about interpreting certain, not all cases, in certain cases. And so it seems embedded in your argument the necessity to find some sort of ambiguity in order to reach the construction you're asking us to impose. And so I'm wondering, given your argument itself, its structure, how you're focused us here at oral argument and in your briefing, why doesn't the rule of lenity quintessentially apply here? I would suggest my direction to look at, at the marginal notes yeah. as more of corroboration of the Commonwealth's point. I, I would suggest that the, the, certainly the intent of the legislature in enacting the 1996 and, and when was in, anything. In, in the canons of construction, when do we look at the legislative intent? We we look the court looks at the verb the the verbiage the plain the language. language of the statute is where we start right and, and, and I would reach to the legislative intent the reports the etc. You know only in cases where there's an ambiguity, and that's where you're pointing us. I would suggest the, the Collins underlying argument that there is no the, there is no ambigu ambiguity uh, because the in the Commonwealth's viewpoint the, the language is, is not ambiguous. Well, the the language two seventy nine two is not ambiguous, but arguably it's inconsistent with other statutes. So does that allow for the rule of lenity? Well, if it were going to, if you were going to supersede, um, if that's the direct, or are you talking about it at like implied repeal? Is that? No, I'm, I'm saying that in, in the same manner as criminal sen uh, cases, there's not a lot of ambiguity there, uh, but you've got other statutes that, 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 that talk about how we address juvenile cases in general and, and We've got, uh, I know this is not legislative interpretation, we've got this embedded in juvenile court best practices for sentences, it's, it's, it's pretty out there. I, I understand that this, this is best practices and certainly the rehabilitative umbrella of the juvenile court, but, but I would point the court to the language, um, so although 52 and through 63 have to be construed liberally, the court left in the language, as far as practicable, children brought before the court be treated not as criminals, but as, as children in need of aid, guidance, and support. But the language, as far as practicable, which actually the Connor Court, Connor C Court, brought to mind too, that, that's very important, especially in the light of the whole reason behind the, one, the 1996 Act, which was to address Violent crimes, specifically firearms, committed committed by juveniles, and I and I would also um, mention to the court that it's very notable that 279.2 does not fall under that liberally construed mandate. Now, um, again, where the legislature set out to address gun violence, where 269.10a is the only statute contained in the youthful offender definition, where the legislature mandated 
a DYS commitment on delinquencies involving firearms, where the legislature mandated that nothing in the, the youthful offender definition clause shall allow for less than the imposition of the mandatory commitment periods provided in 119.58, and where 269A precludes a suspended sentence, at a minimum, the Commonwealth is asking this court to determine that, at, in, as in the, the issue that was solicited to the amicus, where a judge has adjudicated a defendant, a youthful offender, on a charge of 269.10A and is sentenced pursuant to 119.58C, the judge does not have the authority under 279.2 to suspend that commitment. Unless the court has any other questions, the Commonwealth would rest. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Attorney Freitas. Good morning, and may it please the court, Debbie Freitas on behalf of the youth at Pelly, Miguel Dones. Here, the juvenile court had discretion to suspend the youth's commitment because the language of the statutes at issue can be read harmoniously to give the judge that discretion. And for that reason, the youth asked the court to reaffirm the judge's discretion to impose a DYS commitment to 21 and then uh, suspend that commitment as one of the sentencing options for youthful offenders in the juvenile court. So uh, I think I'll begin by addressing uh, an issue that I, I think I've heard in the background here, and that's the lack of language allowing for suspension of DYS commitments under Chapter 119, Section 58C, is not dispositive of the lack of that option here. That's where, it's because where the legislature has intended to prohibit the suspension of commitments to DYS, specifically, for Chapter 269-10A firearm possession cases. The legislature knows exactly how to do that. But and, why and would they do it for the more serious, I mean for the less serious juvenile offender pre prevent suspension in that context but allow it in the context of a youthful offender? It just seems backwards, right? Uh, so I, I think it's in relation to the fact that the legislature has provided the judge in a youthful offender proceeding so much more discretion and more sentencing options than what a judge in a delinquency would have. And so I think if, if it seems as though it's not making sense, it's probably because we are comparing apples and oranges in that we're comparing the maximum on a delinquency case. But the more apt comparison then is the maximum on a youthful offender case, and that would be uh, a sentence as provided by law, meaning the same sentence that a court could sentence an adult to. Um, when we are comparing the maximum on a delinquency case to what is essentially the minimum on a youthful offender case, uh, it's, not, it's not surprising that that would seem. So, so when you take, I mean, when we look at the juvenile statutes all together and the youthful offender statutes, we, we, we look at this one way. But there's another way to examine this, and that's um, through the lens of the gun legislation and the intent of the legislature with regard to that. And the way that the juvenile would be treated um, by, by, this, by, the, by the not having this, the probation or the suspension would be consistent, wouldn't it, with the adult, what happens to adults? Well, so I, I do think the legislature has signaled its intent to treat gun um, crimes more seriously in that, to the best of my recollection, I believe um, 269.10a is the only possessory crime for which a youth could be indicted. All of the other crimes requiring, I believe, some form of um, violence, meaning the actual infliction or threat of serious infliction of harm. So uh, being the only possessory crime, it is serious, although I think uh, the legislature has provided the appropriate sentencing options. Certainly the judge even here could have provided the full adult uh, sentence to uh, a child, essentially. So the judge had that option, uh, but the individualized sentencing requirements in the juvenile court 
uh, are best suited by allowing the judge to weigh the interests of public safety and the need of the individual before him for rehabilitation to decide between any of the three options, which includes uh, a commitment to 21, which thereafter can be suspended. And it can be suspended because the legislature has not taken away that uh, power of the court. And but, it did but, for delinquents. But counsel, what do you say to the, 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 the point that uh, whatever you, the judge can mete out is cabined by the charge. So to the extent that it might say, generally speaking, that the sentencing judge has these three options, you still can't divorce that from looking at the underlying charge. And if the underlying charge says you've got to do 18, you've got to do 18. So even though you might, it might say uh, that uh, you, know, you could have a YO or a delinquency and uh, you can have these three options, that you really don't have those three options when you look at the underlying charge. What do you, what do you say to that? So uh, thank you, Your Honor. To that, I would say that that is certainly true if the judge had decided to sentence the youth under 119.58a, uh, which allows for the sentences provided by law. It, it is not true for the other two options, which is the adult combination sentence or the commitment to DYS. What, gets, what, she, what gets you out of the other two options, I guess? I'm, I'm uh, so if, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, please. Uh, if, if we were to apply 269.10a um, and how it compares to the YO sentencing statute, uh, I believe that 269.10a only allows for commitment to a house of correction or commitment to the state prison. Although here, I believe even in the Commonwealth's brief, they concede that at least the judge in the, in the YO could have committed to DYS instead. Uh, I think that also uh, is true for option two, the combination sentence, in that I believe 269.10a precludes a uh, suspended sentence. Uh, but of course, option B uh, under chapter 119, section 58, specifically allows for the suspension of an adult sentence. And so for that reason, I think it's uh, important that we recognize that as long as the judge is sentencing the youth uh, as a youth using one of the options other than chapter 119, section 58A, the sentence is provided by law, mm -hmm. the judge has the opportunity to actually treat him as a juvenile and not consider um, the limitations that would otherwise be imposed on an adult. You, you begin your presentation with read harmoniously, it gets you to, can you just give me the ABCs and how I read this harmoniously? given an option C and a 10A conviction. Give me the statutory rundown of how we get to a suspended sentence, please. Yes, uh, I'm happy to do that. So we begin with chapter 119.58C. That allows for the judge to impose a commitment to 21. Uh, the judge can thereafter suspend that because the legislature has allowed the suspension of commitments, quote, in all cases in 279, in chapter 279, section two. Uh, the judge, once imposing um, that commitment and suspending it, may offer the youth probation conditions under chapter two, um, excuse me. Yes, thank you, Your Honor, 276, section 87. Which one of those pretrial probation though, right? Uh, so I believe chapter 276, section 87, governs both pretrial and probation after a finding of guilt. 87, you think? Yes, Your is, Honor. Is more than uh, pretrial probation? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. I, I believe it allows the judge to impose um, probation conditions in, quote, any case so after they, a finding so, of so guilt. So just to, to recap, the ABCs are 58C, 279.2, and then probation with 87. Yes, Your Honor. But can you explain to me how the how the 279.2 allows um, a, a, a suspended sentence if it has to be imposed in the same manner and with the same effect as execution of sentences in criminal cases, and there there wouldn't be the availability of a suspended sentence? Yes, Your Honor. Thank so you. the Commonwealth reads the language in 279.2 as synonymous to to the same extent, but that is not the plain language of 279.2. The plain language there is in the same manner and with the same effect. That language does not limit the availability of suspension, uh, suspended commitments. It analogizes to the 
the adult criminal um, case system. And that's because the 1996 amendments did a lot of things, but they didn't eviscerate the treatment of children who violate uh, laws that they're not criminal proceedings, not even youthful offender cases. And so what it does is it provides an analogy for otherwise we wouldn't, uh, that language wouldn't have any effect in the same manner and in the same extent allows us to then be able to um, continue or revoke cases where otherwise- Can you make an argument that even if 279.2 wouldn't allow for the suspension of, of, of um, criminal case and here we have a, a youthful offender and so they couldn't be able to receive a suspended sentence arguably under the plain language of 279.2 but if you go to 119.58 in the actual statute that we're looking at some paragraph B actually allows for a suspended sentence and then therefore we're looking at something more specific so I, I don't think that uh, the fact that the language doesn't appear in 58C but does in B is necessarily dispositive of what the judge could not or could do under uh, option C. And that's because the legislature has um, demonstrated that where they wanted to take away a judge's power uh, to uh, impose a suspended DYS commitment, it knows how to do that. And it did so in Chapter 119, Section 58, specifically the seventh paragraph. There, the legislature was uh, unambiguous about taking away a judge's opportunity to suspend that sentence. And uh, this court itself, in Connor C., granted it was 20 years ago, looked at that provision and determined it did not apply to youthful offenders. And I believe at that time, uh, the court addressed uh, whether or not that would be an incongruous result given that youthful offenders are a more serious category of charging than delinquents. And this court said no, and that's because the sentence for a youthful offender is more severe in that um, a delinquency charge, and the jurisdiction of the court ends at 18. And that is not true for a youthful offender. That, that child continues to have an enduring relationship with the court. And so, of course, a suspended sentence is not a promise that they will not be committed. It, it's, it says, today you will not be. And so the enduring relationship, a period of three years longer than what a delinquent would be, a delinquent child would be exposed to, that matters. In fact, for a child who's 18, uh, three years represents one sixth of their life. And that's that's a significant amount of time, and certainly a more severe uh, sentencing option than the ones that are provided to uh, delinquent children. And uh, so, if there are no other questions, I. I'd be remiss if I didn't note that the Commonwealth has certainly relied on the plain language and, and has come to the opposite conclusion that I have, even though I also have argued that it is the plain language that governs here. And the Commonwealth has also offered numerous uh, principles of statutory construction in support of its view, as have I. And so uh, if, if the court, uh, if there's any plausible way that the statutes can be read ambiguously, uh, I remind the court that the rule of lenity requires that the court uh, view that uh, as, as the child being entitled to the benefit of that ambiguity. Right. You know, a disagreement doesn't mean that it's ambiguous. Yes, Your Honor, I do understand that. Okay. If there are no further questions, I'll rest on my brief. 